Hi everybody, welcome to day 25 of the lockdown. Uh, today I've been drying out the kilns, a little bit about the kiln and how it works and uh, that's the beginning of the video and then it's just been a question of prepping these uh, pots and putting wadding on these pots. It's a bit boring but uh, there's a little bit how about how I do that and uh, that's what's taken up a lot of today really and uh, here's the video. Hi, good morning. I'm just uh, drying out the kiln. It's got very wet over the winter, uh, over the Christmas period, as it's outdoors and open to the elements. So uh, I've just stacked the kiln shelves inside on little props and turned the burner on. But it's a good, uh, it's a good way of showing you how the the burner ports work uh, with them in action. And I'm going to brick the uh, door up a little bit more loosely so that uh, it dries out properly, ready for stacking tomorrow. Okay. So here's the burner, gas comes from over here, gas line in, gas tap, off tap, that's a variable tap, this is the primary air here, and slide backwards and forwards to give you reduction, goes through and into there, there's the burner port, and here inside you can see the flame coming in, it shoots along this trough here. As you can see here, there is a trough. That's called the bag wall. I'll just show it you under the side. So this here is the bag wall. These are the shelves. It hits a deflector brick, it goes along here, hits the deflector brick, comes up inside the kiln, down, down the front here, you can't see it. Along here, there's a gap under the floor, around the kiln and up and out of this chimney here and there's the damper, the chimney goes up out through the ceiling so that's, that's how a downdraft kiln works the gas goes in at the bottom, up into the kiln, down, which is the downdraft, down into the chimney and out, um, just as simple as it is uh, so I'm just going to turn this down a little bit now because it's a bit fierce that at the moment So you can imagine now the power that goes into this kiln when there's two of these burners on It's on about a quarter at the moment there and um, uh, So it, it gets pretty hot in there over 12 hours. So uh, Scary stuff. <laughs> My daughter says I have a dragon in the shed It's not far off really Okay Okay, now we have the uh, tedious task of putting wadding on the bottom of all these pots ready for the firing uh, on Sunday. Uh, this is the wadding. I roll it out, score it, and then leave it to dry, and then they break off into little tiles. This is uh, clay, alumina, and uh, flour, because the flour burns away, but the flour makes it more malleable and easier to roll out like pastry. Okay, so it's a question of three for each of the bottom of these. I've found that it's best to do this on a rack at head height. That way you're not bending over and giving yourself backache all day. So today, for the next few hours, it's going to be this. Just a question of a little blob of wood glue. And then place the foot of the pot on there. Like I said, tedious. Tedious but necessary.
rabbit, that's today. That sort of uh, sums up pottery, doesn't it, really, for me, or sums up life. The excitement and the boredom. The excitement of flame and um, the boredom and tediousness of prepping stuff to put in the flames. So uh, that was today's video. Uh, I was asked on one of the comments on the site about why I like, uh, he called it Asian pottery, Korean and Japanese pottery. Um, it stems back to when I was a kid, I was a teenager and I saw uh, a movie called The Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa and I was obsessed by this, this film, it was a fantastic film. And uh, so that's the point that sort of piqued my curiosity about Japan and it's built over the years. So that was the first sort of watershed moment. And the second one was um, seeing Ken Matsuzaki's uh, exhibition at Goldmark in it was 2011. I went there, I met him and uh, that that's the kind of, I saw his work and I thought that's where I'm, that's the kind of thing I want to make. You know, I felt a sort of a, an affinity with it. So that was that. And then in 2013 I was lucky enough to go to Japan and I went to the uh, museums and one of them I went to was the Minge Museum and it's the Folk Art Museum and that's what brings me on to my next book. Uh, the Folk Art Museum was set up by Soetsu Yanagi and Bernard Leach and uh, Soji Hamada or Hamada Soji and this book is called The Unknown Craftsman and it's by Soetsu Yanagi who started the Minge philosophy and the book is about the Minge philosophy of folk art and how it affects art and life and religion and um, it really is a good a good read uh, a subtitle is A Japanese Insight into Beauty and it's a translation of some of his writings so uh, that's today's book uh, one of my top five books I must admit that I would not want to get rid of right. so that's it I uh, hope that was okay for you. Uh, if you're uh, feeling down to talk to someone, if it's starting to get to you, this um, uh, this way of life we've come to now, after nine months, uh, if it gets you down, talk to somebody. Okay. Okay. See you tomorrow.